uh, my name is Jonas Karlsson, and I'm happy to introduce um, Andrew Hessel here, who's going to talk about genomics uh, here at Google. And uh, this talk is video recorded for a wider audience, which is going to be available on the Google video later on. Andrew Hessel has been a genomic scientist and facilitated development and adoption of DNA technology for over more than 15 years. And his uh, first focus was on sequencing. Uh, later on, he worked on bioinformatics analysis. Uh, since 2003 and practical writing of DNA code and he's going to talk more about that which is quite interesting uh, subject making it available to lay people. He's worked with a leading uh, genomics group in industry and academia uh, including Amgen Incorporation, Thousands Oak in California, University Health Network in Toronto, Canada, MIT and Cambridge, Massachusetts. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I don't expect that many of you have a background in, in genomics or bioinformatics, so you won't, need, um, you won't need that to understand this talk today. I haven't really worked in industry for a number of years or academia. What I've tended to do for the last few years is go around and tell stories about what's possible and bring people together and hook them up to do some interesting work. Uh, the last couple of years has been with MIT, and most recently I'm working with a group in Alberta called the Alberta Ingenuity Fund, which is, uh, funds long-term science projects, so it's an ideal opportunity to hook people together. So this talk, Pimp My Genome, um, we, we're trying to appeal to a younger audience. We're trying to actually uh, show that you know, we're getting to the point where we can do some modifications. So this talk will focus on the mainstreaming of, of what I call digital genetic engineering. Biology is the study of life. Uh, for those of you who have no background in biology, historically it, it has been classifying uh, animals and putting them into some sort of evolutionary framework. Human beings, of course, are, are considered to be at the top of the tree. This is my friend Elizabeth and her daughter Leah. Large animals like elephants, smaller animals like cats. Many, many different species of plants and as we start getting smaller in the animal kingdom, insects and beetles, etc., we see a lot more diversity, thousands or millions, million, many millions of different species. Finally, moving into uh, bacteria, this is E. coli under a, an electron microscope, and finally viruses. Viruses aren't typically considered living organisms. They're really just uh, information packages that tend to hijack various cellular systems. Lots of different morphologies, as you can see here. We don't know how much life there is on this planet in terms of diversity. Uh, the numbers vary between 2 million and 100 million. And I'm, I think that may be off by a factor of 10 or more. We really know. Uh, very little about microorganisms. In fact, a lot of projects that are going on in science today uh, is doing something called metagenomics because most of the microorganisms that do exist on this planet, we can't grow. Um, there's a lot of projects now that will go out and actually collect materials from the environment, just lice the materials take the DNA out of it and actually try and understand what organisms are there just based on their DNA code. Much more computational analysis. This is being applied in a lot of different areas. Craig Venter, uh, one of the, the sequencer, um, uh, formerly of Celera Genomics, one of the groups that was doing the human genome sequencing a number of years ago, has been focusing on this, uh, taking his boat Sorcerer 2 out and taking ocean water samples at various areas. Um, learning a lot about microbial diversity and viral diversity in the oceans. People are doing this even in the human gut, in the gut of various animals like cows, etc. So we're learning a lot about microbial diversity. On the left, um, moving basically to a subcellular component, um, we're starting, there's a tremendous amount of information that's coming out these days. On the left is a bacterial cell. It's basically been squashed, and that's its linear DNA that's been pressed out of it. And, um, uh, uh, and, on, the, and on the right, those are human uh, metaphase chromosomes, basically a very condensed form of DNA. There are thousands, millions, actually, of different enzymes uh, that operate in the cell. Um, all in real time. This is alcohol dehydrogenase. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with it if you've ever had a drink. 
it plugs into much larger pathways inside the cell. This is in the upper uh, corner here, you'll see just a, a known biochemical pathways. Alcohol dehydrogenase fits in right here, takes alcohol and shunts it into fatty acid metabolism, which is why you get a beer gut. Very complex information, all of this working in real time. Most of biology isn't digital, though. Um, this is typically how biologists work. They write things in notebooks. Uh, very hard to get the information out. Science, one of the leading publications, uh, is, is um, again, a print journal. It, um, and we share a lot of information at conferences and just in hallways. This is not the most effective way to do science. Over the last 15 years, though, a lot of uh, digital biology has come to the forefront, largely because the human genome sequencing effort created vast amounts of genomic data. And following from that, we started getting other omics. Proteomics, the study of proteins. Metabolomics, the study of metabolism in cells, et cetera. And we realized we're just getting swamped by all this data. We had to start creating some sort of digital framework to make it understandable. I'm going to focus mainly on genomics, which is my area of expertise. Going back to the, you know, the structure of DNA is, is fairly recent. It was discovered in 1953, so we're, it's the famous picture of Watson and Crick in Cambridge. DNA itself is, is a biochemical information storage molecule. It's digital, it's base four, not binary, but, uh, and it has the unusual feature that it can replicate uh, uh, duplicate perfect fidelity and copy itself by this unwinding and enzymatic processes for duplicating each strand using it as a template. I've always looked at DNA as, the, as essentially machine language for biochemical processes uh, going on in cellular systems. Genomes are very special programs. Um, that actually have enough information to encode the processor as well as the machinery to duplicate the program and make sure it gets installed on the new processors that are made. Not all genomic circuits, uh, not all DNA circuits or constructs have to have this much information. If there's an existing operating system in a cell, we can just add a small, com uh, a small bit of DNA that can just add a new feature or metabolism. But a genome typically is a self-sustaining program. Genomes vary widely. Uh, small bacterial genomes have about 1.8 million base pairs of DNA. Uh, humans have about 3 billion. You'll notice that the number of genes doesn't scale quite the same. Escherichia coli has about 4,000 genes, actually. A human being has somewhere between 25,000 and 30,000. So bacteria are still very complex organisms. They're just highly compressed. From a computer scientist's point of view, DNA can really be looked at as information on a hard disk. Zeros and ones, um, very, very similar um, f um, uh, ideologies going on between the two. Most of the processes that you will have um, on uh, reading and writing information to a hard disk we can, find, uh, we can find similar processes happening in, in biochemical systems in the cell. We didn't create cells, though. We had to learn how to read the code. And this has been an ongoing problem um, uh, f you know, since DNA was discovered. Um, we started to make progress in the, early in the 1970s. Uh, this fellow is Fred Sanger, who developed a, a method for reading DNA depicted with this high-tech tool here. Um, this was a really laborious process for trying to read DNA code. It was toxic. It required radioisotopes. It was slow. In 1980, if you could do 500 base pairs of sequence a day, you were doing really well. Um, a fellow by the name of Lloyd Smith ended up developing a way to do this in an automated fashion, which was ultimately commercialized in the late 80s uh, by a company called Applied Biosystems. And throughput started to increase. This is about the time that the Human Genome Project was announced. It still wasn't, these machines weren't fast enough to do the human genome, but they felt that the technology was on a roll and would continue to grow quickly. 
So by 1995, the throughput had gone up to about 144,000 bases. And 1998, when Celera Genomics started to, to uh, do the human genome sequence and the public groups uh, working um, in a very high throughput capacity, they were using a machine called the ABI 3700. Uh, which was the real workhorse of the human genome. Today, and you know, almost 10 years later, we have throughputs that basically are approaching about a gigabase a day, uh, very fast, one sequencing run, extremely cheap. So the ability to sequence DNA has grown very rapidly. In fact, graphed out, um, the rate of the rate uh, of being able to produce sequence and the cost of producing sequence essentially falls to the point. In another 10 years, 15 years, uh, we should be able to see uh, your entire genome sequenced as, as a, a standard uh, uh, therapeutic or diagnostic procedure. That's assuming no dramatic leaps in the technology. However, um, the XPRIZE Foundation, uh, and I notice you have that wonderful Spaceship One hanging in your lobby, um, has announced late last year that they would have a $10 million incentive prize for technology that would allow uh, basically 100 genomes to be sequenced in 10 days at a cost of about $1,000 per genome. So they, they said the first prize was to go and venture into outer space. Now they want to go into inner space. So we're going to see some dramatic developments in the short term. DNA is a language. Okay, so we've got reading pretty much on track. Comprehension has changed a lot over the last, over the last 15 years. Um, this was my first bioinformatic machine, essentially. Um, and with small little shareware programs like DNA Strider, that, which was more than sufficient for analyzing the amount of genetic sequence I had to play with. My first copy of GenBank came on floppies. Now um, on the bottom is a, a picture of Blue Gene L, um, one of the most powerful supercomputers on the planet, which is now often tasked to various uh, bioinformatic type processes beyond my league. So biology is moving digitally. This is just a representation of, of uh, an enteric uh, genome. Uh, basically a small gut bacterium genome. We can lay on lots of different data now. Most of these types of, of uh, genome um, visualizations and analyses are pretty much fully automated today. We can do comparative genomics, looking at how one genome uh, compares to another. Uh, most of these processes are done very quickly. With the newer machines, we can sequence a bacterial genome uh, in basically one run and, and produce uh, a map of its metabolism in an afternoon. So we've got about uh, five or 600 bacterial genomes available publicly now, uh, and more genomes are being added every day. Um, we can also look at other areas or, or windows into the genome. This is what's called comparative genomic hybridization. It's basically looking at changes in copy number from breast cancer tissues. Uh, this is the type of thing we sometimes see where regions of the genome have been selectively amplified uh, because some gene is, uh, important in the cancer process or that's involved in the cancer processes is being upregulated uh, at a genomic level. Genomes are not um, uh, fixed entities. They're highly plastic and dynamic, and more groups are starting to realize this now and publish data on this. We can also look at things like gene expression over time. Uh, this is this type of heat map is taking a look at uh, essentially messenger RNAs, which are like working copies of the genome going out into the cellular metabolism and being turned into proteins, et cetera. This is a really quick way of, um, of looking at what the cell is doing at a given point in time. And um, we can analyze basically every gene in the genome, the human genome, uh, in one single experiment and, um, or any other uh, life form basically at this point. Yes? Sorry? What's the, what's the definition of a gene? I mean, I understand it's multiple base pairs, but... Um, uh, you can basically look at it as a functional biochemical unit. Um, the, old, the, the old terminology was one gene produced one protein in the cell, but there's a lot of regulatory genes as well and other genes that may only act at the level of, uh, uh, of um, uh, controlling some other process. It doesn't necessarily have to go always to a protein. But, so you can just look at it as a functional unit. Today, the 
digital biology has been growing so quickly and pulling in a lot of different areas um, against uh, metabol uh, metabolism, proteins, uh, reaching out and looking into literature as well, digital literature, and uh, protein protein interactions, etc. It's a complicated web of, of data now that has been growing very quickly. In fact, we're starting to run into the problem that you know, we keep drilling down onto finer and finer levels into, into cellular processes and we run up against complexity. We just don't really understand what's going on and it takes a tremendous amount of processing power. The more we look, the more complexity we see. Today, just storing and accessing some of the biological data sets is becoming a real challenge because there's no real commercial model to support the growth of the server systems and the data systems. They're, most of it is publicly supported. Um, and of course, there's our limited finite comprehension. Uh, we simply can't wrap our brains around biology. Most of, the, most of the people working today will drill down into very fine specializations. So we're getting a lot of functional barriers between, uh, between different groups and uh, working. This has led to um, uh, the growth of something called systems biology, which is really applying uh, uh, algorithms to doing things like determining gene function, doing diagnostics, and being able to make predictive models and visualizations, etc. Uh, this is Lee Hood. He's probably one of the he is one of the leaders in systems biology work. He has an institute uh, in Seattle called the Institute for Systems Biology, um, and he's um, uh, he's struggling in some ways because they still don't even, they can't even agree on a definition of systems biology today. In many ways it's just biology in a digital age and it's going to become increasingly complicated. Why is it complicated? Well, it's because we can't always extract the information of why things are. This is a representation of, of a structure in a cell called a nuclear pore. It's basically a doorway between the inside of, of the nucleus where, the, where DNA is kept in a eukaryotic cell and the cellular metabolism. As you can see in this cartoon, there's all sorts of little <laughs> little parts and pieces in this mechanism. I have no idea how this thing works. Um, I can't, it, if I needed a pore or some sort of channel in, in a synthetic cell I was building, I wouldn't necessarily recreate this because I don't know what it can or cannot do. This has been, uh, you know, the work of, of hundreds of researchers to determine this structure. This is an evolved electronic circuit. Most electrical engineers wouldn't be able to figure it out either. It, it was evolved in an environment that basically selected for a certain output. This will take the square root of an input voltage. But most, we can't determine how or why it works very easily. It's not, it's not designed for human comprehension. It's, it's been selected for a function possibly the same way that the nuclear pore has been selected for a function, and we may never be able to figure it out completely. So evolution, a lot of the reasons and, and the, basically the documentation behind why something is doing, uh, working a certain way is lost through the evolutionary process. So if we're going to do genetic engineering, that means we have to be able to write code. Um, I put engineering in quotes because it hasn't really been engineering up to now. It's largely been one-off art forms. And this is where we have to start changing the way we think as biologists. If we can't build it, we really don't understand it. Genetic engineering dates back to the early 1970s. The first, the first manipulations of the DNA molecule were essentially done in 1972 and 73. They were pretty simple, but they sure set off a chain of, of a lot of speculation as to be what would be possible. The main thing that was done by doing this work was that the species barrier was dropped. We could take DNA from a plant or a marine organism and splice it in with humans or any other animal. This simply wasn't possible before with breeding. Even then, it took a number of years past 1972 for this to really start reaching mainstream consciousness. Um, this is what, 1977 before it really started making the front page of Time. 
And then the biotech boom starting in 1981, the first biotech boom, the wave of companies, many of which still exist today, um, uh, capitalizing on some of these uh, new techniques. DNA and electronics have, a, in some ways, a very shared history. Um, DNA was discovered about five years after the transistor has really a lot of potential for the same potential for, for large influences on society. And in some ways, almost very similar industrial growth curves. Uh, the companies that, were th that, um, that grew out of the 1970s and 1980s shared very similar economic um, uh, curves in their growth, but have recently flattened out. Even looking at labs, uh, level four containment laboratory where you don't want people getting infected by the materials working with, looks pretty similar to a chip fab where you don't want the materials that are being manipulated infected by humans. The first generation DNA manipulations were largely done using what's called splicing, gene splicing. This is using molecular scissors to cut DNA at a certain point as depicted in this wonderful little cartoon, and put sticky ends together. They're basically like, um, uh, uh, basically like doing ransom note type work. I'll show a little graphic on that. This is a typical molecular biology lab today. Um, it, liquid handling devices, all sorts of chemicals and reagents, a lot of them homemade. A more sophisticated unit with robotic liquid handling, being able to do some high throughput work. And you know, people literally working at lab benches. It's a lot like witchcraft, because they simply cannot see what's going on. They have to trust that the reactions are proceeding in a certain way and that things are happening the way they think they should. It's all very indirect. After about 10 years working in biotech, I thought, there has to be a better way. I took a year off and I went to this beach in Thailand and just started thinking, processing the last few years of my life and going, where can I take this to a new level where we can actually start speeding things up? The biotech industry just seemed to be getting slower and slower. The 10 years to make a drug, over a billion dollars to get something out. It just seemed like it wasn't going to be able to respond to the needs of humanity over time. So I started to think a lot about genomic programming. Cutting and splicing applied to text would give you something like this. I sat down with last month's Wired magazine and tried to write this simple sentence. It took me an hour and 19 minutes. It took me th about 45 seconds to type it on my word processor, have it spell checked, print it, and upload it to my blog for the world. So the technology that we're using today for most of our genetic engineering is obsolete. And this technology is in use today worldwide. It's, the, it's still considered the gold standard. At very best, it's, it's like typesetting. The words have to exist. Yes, if you, if you put it all together, you can, you can print a book but it's not very dynamic or flexible. So we've had this tremendous advance in sequencing going from physical DNA to digital DNA over the last, over the last decade. The reverse process seemed obvious. We need synthesis. We need to be able to go from some sort of digital s sequence that we may devise and go back to physical DNA so we can upload it into the cell and test it. When I started talking with people about this, though, it, they just couldn't seem to get it. No one wanted to work building synthesizers. No one wanted to put the effort in. And I couldn't really understand why. So I just had to let it drop for a while. We've had the technology for doing DNA synthesis for over 20 years. It's a very simple process. It's cyclical. Basically, uh, DNA is built on a solid glass matrix a new base is added, any reaction that doesn't go to completion is capped, the next base is added and it goes on in a cyclical process. The problem is errors accumulate, so we can't make very long chains of DNA. We can only, after about 100 bases, you end up getting, with a 1% error, you end up having an error somewhere in that sequence. These are different types of DNA s synthesizers. Oh, sorry. Are you going to be able to get that up? Yeah. Okay. There we go. So these are different DNA synthesizers uh, that are available um, 
from various manufacturers. In the upper uh, left-hand corner is a Beckman eight-channel device. Uh, up in the upper right are machines called mermaids. Uh, they go up to 384 channels. These were used to do a lot of the sequencing work in the public human genome project. Newer technologies use the same chemistries, but just on smaller scales, so the reagent costs are a lot cheaper. Uh, this is a microreactor, um, basically working on a, a lab on a chip system. These are, this is a digital light processor chip from Texas Instruments, which has about 780,000 elements, meaning you can make 780,000 different strands of DNA on a solid glass matrix in one single experiment. And newer technologies uh, have basically no moving parts or just ultraviolet LEDs with capillary tubes. You can go, I pulled this up on eBay last night, you can go and buy this equipment um, basically for next to nothing, $89. Pick up your own DNA synthesizer, take it home, play around in your basement. This is just showing how, this slide just shows how they put these smaller fragments together. This is where all the work is. We can make DNA for essentially nothing today. But going through the assembly process, taking these smaller pieces and putting them together into larger constructs so that we can actually make something useful is where the technical challenge remains today. There's been, a, there's been some very large steps forward in this in the last few years, but here we're just, here they're assembling a gene that glows green if it assembles properly. It's only 714 base pairs, but trying to get to something that's large enough to encode some You can buy DNA synthesizers for nothing now. They're basically just big doorstops. As you can see, the prices vary. Uh, we're getting down to around 69 cents a base pair. That's for basically any size DNA you want. Uh, small viral genomes will have about 5,000 base pairs. Large viral genomes, about 200,000. And a minimal genome, somewhere on the order of 300,000. So we're getting to the point where we can do some pretty interesting genomic programming having mail order com compiling. Send your DNA sequence, they'll give it to you, you send it back. Graphed out, Moore's law is the red line, DNA sequencing is the blue line, synthesis is the green line. Our capacity for, for synthesizing is growing rapidly and will probably continue to do so for some time. There are groups around the world that, are, that do DNA synthesis now. And uh, essentially, it's, it's, if you have a credit card and can type, you can get DNA. So while I was sitting on that beach in Thailand, I put together another idea, which was, well, if you can synthesize DNA and you can essentially program it like you were programming a computer, mm, you, there's, you can decide how you're going to program it. You can do it proprietary and keep all the code for yourself and try and figure out all the biology. Or you might want to try doing open source biology. Um, and so I started writing about this and, um, and found, and then that introduced me to people that were also thinking along these lines. And I came across these two guys. On the left is Tom Knight at MIT, an electrical engineer, and on the right is Drew Endy, um, uh, one of his colleagues, uh, uh, originally trained, I believe, in civil engineering. They both focus now on engineering biology. And they really supported open source biological programming. In fact, they were pretty far along when I found them. So the engineering process is basically, you know, have some success, refine it, continue to refine it so you have more success, and so on and so on. And the complexity tends to increase. And when you build something, you want it to do what you've, what you've designed it to do. It's, it's stopping the evolutionary process in some ways at, at certain points. It's applied to electronics, of course, software, aeronautics, structures, materials, automotives, but not to biological engineering. So these guys started engineering biology. They took, section, they took DNA code and essentially put it in a wrapper, gave it a part number, gave it a functional name. This, one being a terminator. It stops, uh, it stops uh, RNA polymerase at a certain point so that it says basically, okay, end here. 
Then they went out and measured as many spe parameters of this part as they could and started to build documentation. This allowed the part to be used with other parts in assemblies to build systems. For example, a sender device that actually puts a molecule out uh, across a bacterial membrane. Put it, all this together and we can start having some sort of a framework for engineering biology with parts, devices, and ultimately systems that fully assembled could even go on to make full cells. Mediated between the DNA code and parts is really synthesis. Everything else is just assembly processes of the, of the parts and standardized data that can be machine readable, shared between the different levels. You want to design systems, you don't need to know the DNA code. You just have to be able to pull the parts off the shelf. So they built the first catalog. They had some funds for DNA synthesis. They put together a catalog of various parts, showed that it's working, made them available, open source, and started putting them out to the world, documenting as many, as many functions as they could measure. This is their best part. It has the most measurements. Most of the parts aren't, don't have that many measurements. Test and measurement in biology remains a big challenge. <coughs> they also created something called iGEM. International Genetically Engineered Machines. It's an open source program that essentially, um, that essentially tracks pe uh, people that want to play with these parts and use them and see what they can build with them. It's like a hobby kit for electronics. So it shares everything, parts, codes, protocols, experience, publications, only one rule, share it back. It's grown quickly. Um, I've worked with iGEM since about 2005. Uh, I'm always impressed by, by the types of kids that we get out to it and how much effort they'll put in. In the first years in 2003, it was just in-house at MIT uh, as an independent activities project. They opened it up in 2004 uh, with some five friendly schools. In 2005, there, was thir there were 13 schools. Last year, we had 37 schools from 15 countries and it just keeps growing uh, around the world. We just closed registration for this year 57 teams, 20 countries. It's really international now. Like, I was really surprised by the additions of Russia um, and you know, a number of teams from China. Uh, so we're growing a community of people that can actually do this work, engineering biology, and grow the number of parts very quickly. And it's getting a lot of attention internationally, um, so, which continues to reinforce the growth of this program. Some of the projects that have come out of this in the last few years, just uh, um, a light sensitive bacteria, essentially making a bacteria so you shine a light on it, it ends up producing a color pigment. It makes a bacterial film. Um, so here are just a few of the images they made. Uh, Hello World, of course, uh, tip of the hat, Darwin, and one of their, uh, their supervisor, Andy, uh, Andy Ellington from the University of Texas. Uh, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, they, they built a circuit that, that basically was light sensing and pigment producing and put it into a bacterial chassis, uh, a background. Yeah. So far Not yet. Cell. Not yet. Oh, certainly. Um, uh, they were just, uh, the question was whether this was a complete genome or basically just a, a couple of functions added to a bacterial chassis. And indeed, it, was, it is not a complete genome that's been assembled. It's just a, a new circuit added to the bacterium. This was a group from Scotland last year that created a circuit that essentially allowed, uh, built a biosensor for the detec detection of arsenic in groundwater, which is a big problem in Bangladesh. Um, they're actually trying to commercialize this unit. It's extremely sensitive, better than the chemical tests that are available. It costs about 50 cents a test. If the bacteria, if there's arsenic in the water, it ends up producing an acid and a, and a color indicator turns red, means you shouldn't drink the water. A group at MIT um, decided that their lab was a little too smelly. Bacteria has an odd odor, so they knocked out that odor, first of all, and then they made it so that the bacteria would smell like wintergreen or bananas, depending on its growth 
uh, whether it was in log phase and actively growing or whether it was in stationary phase and had used up all its sugar. And here they're, they're demonstrating the smells. This actually has some really practical applications because a lot of reporter systems require instrumentation to measure, but our nose is extremely sensitive at parts per million. This is what everyone competes for in iGEM, the iGEM Cup. Um, really, that's about it. Recognition, uh, having the chance to, to share their stories at MIT, and uh, a big block of aluminum. Schools around the world are taking notice. Almost every school that gets an iGEM team starts creating a program. Um, Berkeley and MIT were some of the first. Now there's uh, schools all over the world that are building undergraduate programs and considering departments. Um, this is really interesting. Uh, biology is very slow to move, but some of these investments have been fantastic. This fellow, Jay Kiesling, received about $42 million from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for doing some work uh, on an anti-malarial drug. Uh, Berkeley also got a large uh, biofuels project recently. As people um, move beyond, essentially, the iGEM program in these parts, they can graduate into something called open wetware, which is modeled along the lines of MIT's open courseware. Um, looking forward, well, according to economists, uh, this technology is just going to continue to outpace and replace uh, existing bio, uh, recombinant DNA techniques and really accelerate the process. I don't know if we're ready for it. Um, there's a lot of, sorry, yes. Um, the recombinant DNA process is you're actually working with physical DNA doing the editing. It's like that. It's like the ransom note model. Um, with, with synthetic DNA processes, you're basically just typing a sequence of an electronic text file and sending it directly for synthesis much faster. So there's a lot of forces driving this along. Uh, Low-cost DNA synthesis uh, and, and global dissemination of these technologies uh, is amongst them. But there's a lot of risks as well. Um, we don't know how uh, uh, the ability to synthesize DNA and, uh, really opens up the ability to create things like advanced bioweapons, um, be able to uh, generate viruses that would normally be under strict government control. Um, because most of the genome sequence of things like Ebola, smallpox, anthrax, et cetera, are already in the public domain. So this is, there are, some, there are some concerns moving forward with this, rightly so. How the government responds to it and how people respond to these technologies over the next few years will really, um, will really change the way it's, they're adopted uh, if, they're, if, if they become, if they move into a military domain uh, and, and people are highly regulated, uh, it, it could go underground. It could be that this, we just never solve some of the problems and it, the rate of development just ends up moving very slowly. Uh, this has been the case in some of, in some of the engineering that, we've, that has gone on in the past. Or it could just open up wide. We could have modular life, garage, people working in their garages designing cures for cancer uh, on using software. I'm hoping that this is the way we move because this is the way computers have moved over the last 25 years. And I think that the, the changes we've seen in the electronic world are fantastic. But we do know there's a risk. This fellow, uh, a fellow by the name of Wimmer, um, synthesized the first virus back in 2002. And he did it, it was a polio virus. And that concerned a lot of people. Today, we're moving towards creating a minimal bacterium. So this is getting to your question. No one has yet booted up a synthetic, fully independent cell. But we expect it very soon. We have, we're starting to get to the point of, of synthesizing genomes large enough to support a minimal bacterium. That's probably a Nobel Prize. You know, that's closing uh, a cycle of evolution that's billions of years old, from primordial oceans to you know, really uh, are being able to build a bacteria. This could very well lead to a next generation biotech industry where that is much more responsive because they can take, in, for example, cancer is always a failure of your genome at some point um, in, in some cells to respond properly to, to uh, and so the, the, the shortest route to correcting it is to work at the level of, of the genome, of DNA. Um, 
this type of technology would allow us to take diagnostic data, put it through a therapeutic engine, and, and potentially craft a customized solution just for you, um, you know, using, it, using, a, uh, using algorithms. We're already seeing next generation biotech companies appearing, focusing on things like engineering organisms for biofuels um, and, and therapeutic molecules. There's, a, uh, there's probably a dozen of these companies globally now, and I see more and more business plans for, for companies like it, because you don't need the overhead. You don't need the labs. Drew Endy has been going around and talking with people about building what's, what he calls biofabs. Uh, essentially high quality parts along the same lines as the iGEM program but, but, uh, but very well designed, well documented that could be used for, for much more serious research or possibly therapeutics. And there's a number of different groups around the world that are looking at putting together biofabs, sharing information, sharing parts. Um, there'll be proprietary ones as well. We're also seeing very new ways of going out and raising support for this type of work, which is considered very leading edge. Um, this fellow, uh, Aubrey de Grey, created his own foundation, has raised millions of dollars towards, towards doing some cellular repair type engineering. And uh, a very interesting man, but you know, no one would give him grants, so he just built essentially a, a granting agency. This is a simulation of a very simple virus, T7 bacteriophage. It's a virus that only infects bacteria. Drew Endy gave me this simulation. It was done by a couple of people in his lab, Sri Kosuri and Jason Kelly. Um, it's really fast. It's dynamic. It's basically showing the amount of M messenger RNAs, which correlates to proteins in this virus when it infects a bacterial cell. But there's a problem. It really doesn't correlate to the real world data. This is one of the simplest organisms um, that we can work with, and we still can't really tie the models into real-world data yet. We're still learning how to do things. This is a, a graphic of, of just a, a cellular membrane. It's an agent-based model done by this group in Alberta, and they keep, they keep adding to the membrane, and it starts doing these interesting, very... Uh, um, uh, getting all these features on the surface, but they don't know why. We don't know. This. this is a very simple model of a cell. We still don't understand the processes that are going on. Eventually, this, it goes, it, it, the model tears into the cell and takes a look at various channels that have been made internally. But we, this is about as simple as it gets. We still don't understand it. Quite possibly, it'll take thousands hundreds of thousands of people contributing their expertise into some sort of global model for us to really start getting our heads wrapped around this. I love the idea of Google Earth and people being able to do, the, do SketchUp and build you know, their favorite buildings, et cetera. Maybe one day we need something like that with, with various molecules operating in biochemical systems. At the level of the bacteria, it probably wouldn't be too burdensome. Overall, the area that I look for uh, and, and what keeps me very interested in this. This is, this is from 25 years ago today, May 3rd, 19, you know, uh, 1982. It's the kids that are going to really take this technology and keep pushing it forward. They're attracted to genomic programming as they were to programming PCs 25 years ago. And I just really hope that we can provide this technology for them as early as possible in the educational system so that they can become acquainted with it and play with it. 25 years ago, you could get these comics from Radio Shack that basically put in an in a easy-to-read form um, you know, some of the basics of computing. Um, the group at MIT has done the same thing. This comic uh, describes a lot of the processes they're doing. It's been translated into a dozen different languages now. We'll, they're working on issue two. But this is what really, um, I think, exemplifies where we need to be going. This is a kit I bought at a science center last year. Um, it's a very powerful DNA extraction kit. Uh, it comes with all these little exercises, freeze-dried bacteria, plasmid DNA for making what's called green fluorescent protein, and all the instructions for getting that DNA into the cell, and even comes with a little LED keychain so you can check to see if your, if your cells have taken up the DNA and are glowing under UV light. Wonderful little kit. 
24.95, ages eight and up. I think that's where we need to be taking these technologies, um, you know, and moving them forward for the next 25 years. And that's basically it. Um, I'd like to thank Drew Endy for a lot of the slides and graphics and for, uh, for his work with the iGen program. The iGen program and all the people that I work with, BioAero for some of the economic data that I used in this, CyberCell for some of the models, uh, Jonas for the invitation, thank you, and Alberta Ingenuity for supporting my going around and talking to people about this work. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and Andrew. And uh, I just want to mention that Audrey is going to be uh, visiting here in the end of the month. Um, kudos to you, who um, managed to connect us. So he will be here giving another interesting talk. And uh, I leave now the floor open to questions and discussions. And please repeat the question. Certainly. You, you spent a lot of time in your talk talking about um, It seems to me that there, there's a step here that you missed from the, the digital part, which is, in your analogy, the program in the cell, which is the computer that operates on the program to generate itself. That, that you can't do this completely digitally because you're going to end up with just a program and you want nothing to execute it. So I, I, I don't see your some closure, some transitive closure that's missing. Right, so um, the question is basically how do we go from, from a digital program to a fully operating cellular system? Um, that's an open question at this point. There's, the, uh, groups are taking a variety of approaches. One is we can take bacterial cells and essentially destroy the endogenous DNA in that cell, creating kind of a, an egg. So it, it's a bag of chemicals that is non-metabolizing just that if we add a genome to it, can start to run that program. Um, so that's one route. Other groups are taking the approach, well, that's, that's good, but not good enough. Um, and they are trying to create what are called protocells, essentially fully defined artificial cells that they could put a defined synthetic genome in um, and have it operate. Uh, or or not, not always a genome. Um, sometimes just enough genetic material to run a metabolic uh, reaction uh, over a period of time. So almost like a disposable cell. So those two approaches are, are, um, uh, are underway by a number of different groups. It's, no one has, has successfully made a, 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 a protocell at this point or a fully or booted up a bacterium. But we expect it very soon. So basically, right now you want is like something to be done, like breakthrough in biology, right? So how computer industry or like how a computer can help you in that phase? So like, uh, what's required by you? One of the one of the things that we're missing today, um, uh, I showed you that first catalog of parts. Um, that that is a, a database that is not easily um, isn't very open. It is it, it's not easy to share. The, it's hard to put data in and extract it out. We don't have a simple editor yet where we can just take a part that someone's defined and drop it into um, uh, and and literally do drag and drop editing of different modules to create a, a, a synthetic construct or circuit. I don't think that's a, a major programming effort, but, but trying to, a lot of biology works on, in very small groups, sometimes just a few people, and trying to coordinate, um, trying to get someone tasked full time to even a small project can be very difficult for a lot of labs. Most research labs operate on a few hundred thousand dollars per year total. Um, I would, I would really like, if anyone is interested in doing some sort of software development for synthetic biology, not going out and trying to um, aggregate and pull together and make sense out of the masses of biological data in the world, the systems biology effort, which, uh, uh, again, it, I, th I think 
in some ways gets bogged down after a while. But if someone wants to start doing some sort of programming to facilitate the design of genomes and, and the collection of parts, I, I'd certainly like to put them together with some folks at MIT that have a lot of experience with this. I had another question for you. Now, we've been successful uh, using recombinant DNA technology for kind of cloning different forms of, um, it could be lamb, sheep, and so on. So what is so complicated about the bacterium that we're not able to generate or evolve a complete bacterium right from scratch? What constitutes the, the level of difficulty? Well, the cloning experiments are actually a little different. Right. Cloning, cloning really doesn't do any re-engineering of the genome. It's, it's, just, it's just taking DNA from one cell and getting it to work in an egg to regrow the whole organism. So you're not actually doing genetic engineering on the genomic material itself. Okay. Um, but for example, some, some companies manufacture therapeutic proteins by taking the gene for, for that protein and putting it into uh, a different cell so that they can grow it in a bioreactor. Right. Um, that type of work is more traditional genetic engineering. It's extremely slow and difficult because, again, they're working with the physical DNA molecule and, and having to use these molecular scissors to cut and paste it together, and it's a very slow process. Today, we can actually do that just by using a computer program, output the DNA, and do this far faster and test much more diverse, um, uh, uh, a diverse space in, in the code um, uh, to make this work. And different groups are doing this now. It is actually cheaper to synthesize most genes than it is to clone it now. So using yes. the synthesis of genes as against cloning, have you been able to um, maybe generate something similar as in, let's say, in the past we've seen that recombinant DNA, even though it's a very slow technology, yes. has been able to generate results. So what form of results have you been able to generate using the, the newer form? As in, do you have libraries of different forms of uh, organisms? Have, or? Yes. Uh, well, even just in the genetic parts that I mentioned, we have over a thousand genetic parts in the collection now defined. So things like promoters for turning genes on, various coding regions for various proteins, terminators to turn genes off, various switches and control devices. We're actually building up a very large library of parts that are very modular and can interchange. Um, all of the work that's done with recombinant DNA technology, we can replicate very quickly. But more than that, um, if we know that, for example, that we have this three-dimensional structure of an enzyme, we know where the active site of that enzyme is, where the actual chemical reactions are occurring, we can program the synthesizers to change the, the nucleic acids in certain regions, ultimately leading, leading to diversity in the amino acids in those regions. And then we can take all of those variants and put them through high throughput screens and ultimately select for, for um, uh, variants that have different activities. So we're getting very good at single protein engineering using synthetic technologies. Now it's can we do something more with that, build more complex systems with fail-safe checksums, balances, et cetera, and ultimately synthetic organisms. By the way, viruses are, are a little bit different um, than the synthetic bacteria because you don't actually need the egg, so to speak. You just literally take the DNA or the nucleic material and infect a cell with it, and it will produce virus particles. All you have to do is lyse the cell and, and filter them out. Okay, so in, in computer language, uh, we have a control statements which will just to dictate uh, what the control flow will go to this function unit or that function unit. So I just wonder, uh, in, in this synthetic uh, world, uh, is there any such kind of counterparts and how? So looks to me that you cannot just uh, assemble all the functional units together and expect the cell to do exactly the same thing because you need to also have some logic and to yes. direct uh, um, how the various functions are going on forward and how they are coordinated with each other. So what's uh, those kind of logic in the synthetic world? We're going to have to build it. Um, this, is, this is one of the challenges now. We're the circuits that we're building, if you're doing it with electronics, would be their toys. 
um, and yet this is leading edge genetic engineering. Trying to put together complex circuits and measure how all of those circuits are working is, is one of the challenges that we all face. We don't know how to do it. So we're just starting at the ground up, building the simplest circuits and trying to, to run them and measure them and test them and have them work reliably. Um, and hopefully we can build complexity step by step over time and keep control. Yes? So when you say synthesis of uh, DNA, so if you, if you are given a, like a code for DNA, uh, so how accurate that synthesis can be made? So if there is a, even a single 0.1% of error or like, let's say some modification, then in terms of like real human, uh, you, like living being, it can be some sort of disasters also, right? The, the gene synthesis companies that work today um, actually make many times more uh, uh, make multiple versions of the DNA and they end up having a sequence to verify uh, that the assemblies have, have worked properly. So it's not as accurate as, as a compiler. Um, the, all the biological processes have, have are fuzzy. They've, there's been um, some techniques that were developed over the last few years where they actually use the, uh, the DNA repair systems that are present even in very simple cells that look for mismatches of DNA to, uh, um, to remove some of the, um, uh, to remove some of the inappropriately assembled constructs. So, um, so we're getting better at assembly direct from a text file to the final output. But today the gold standard is we still have to sequence the result to make sure that it's accurate to the base pair. Of course, once you actually load that into the cell and have it operating, there's no, there's no guarantee that it's going to stay stable because the code can still mutate and change. And so these are, these are problems. But. Um. Uh, I just thought it was interesting, the, the programming language analogy. Uh, it's actually quite interesting, I think, because I, I think a little bit more of data flow when it comes to programming and uh, more functional. We have filter functions and, and a, a flow of data where all the processes kind of continuously exist. And this is more close to how electrical engineering is designed, uh, circuits and so on, right? That there's no circuits, which is an if. It's more of something being on and off. And I think that kind of is an interesting analogy, which might work very well with this in my humble opinion. Is there any more questions here? All right. So the, the actual process is still you make a bunch of material, put it together, a bunch of stuff, and then, <clears throat> and then you look for a percentage or you somehow we can uh, cause it to reproduce or something like that to look at the results. It's not like you make one of something inject into one of something else. And it would be great to have that type of control. Um, we don't yet. When, when we do the chemical synthesis of DNA, we're working in very small volumes today, picomoles um, and picoliters. But, um, but we're still making thousands of strands of, of DNA at once. So. Ultimately, ultimately, if, if this process is done right, only one, uh, only one genome goes into the cell at a time, or one circuit into the cell at a time, and then we, use the, and then we screen um, the cells that have taken up the DNA to make sure that it has the function that we expect. So we use a, a functional selection at the end of it. And DNA does tend to be fairly stable for a number of generations once it's in the cell. So as long as the, uh, as long as the cell isn't being too taxed by whatever circuit is put in there, it, it should stay stable for a number of, for some time. But how do we prevent it from evolving after that? Uh, difficult, because DNA seems to be, um, seems to want to change under, under pressure. It's very adaptable material. Okay, uh, this concludes our session. Uh, if there's any more questions, please feel free to meet up afterwards. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.